Hello, I'm Dana Eastman, your mixologist of the day. I also happen to be the resort manager at uh, Calam's beautiful Canyon Vistas and Superstition Views. Um, and today we're going to learn a little bit about uh, America's spirit, bourbon whiskey. Um, we're going to talk about uh, bourbon uh, as juxtaposed with other American whiskeys. I'll talk a little bit about Canadian whiskey and European style whiskeys like Scotch and Irish whiskeys. Um, and there are some fairly basic differences uh, with all of them. And um, as usual with these Zoom classes, if you've had any, um, you'll be aware of this, but there's a, a chat box, I believe, for you all to type in any questions you may have. And uh, we encourage any and all questions. Don't feel uh, timid about um, quizzing the orator because I, I like to uh, learn stuff as much as you do and hopefully I'll be able to shed a little light on something that maybe you've always wondered uh, but never had the opportunity to ask about. So um, that's the basic, we're gonna do a preamble that's kind of some history and some fun facts about whiskeys. And then we're gonna jump into making three different cocktails. And um, I didn't choose any real traditional cocktails. I chose a bourbon smash, which is um, pretty whimsical by its very nature. A smash is uh, liquor with fruit and um, acid. It's, it's a big, sweet, vibrant cocktail. And we're going to do one that's kind of wintry in that it uses preserved fruit because we're lucky in Arizona, we have access to a lot of fresh fruit in the summertime. But a lot of places, it, it's tough to come by, or sorry, winter time, summer for us, winter for them. Um, and this is one that you can play with and you can do whatever you like to do. Uh, take liberties with any recipe you come across. That's my policy with cooking as well as drinking. Um, nobody's palate is exactly like yours and you should tweak every recipe you make. Um, to make it suit you perfectly. And don't be scared. Um, all you have to do is start over sometimes. Uh, the second one we're gonna try is a, a fairly classic cocktail, but it's, it's got kind of a weird twist. It's called the Brown Derby. And it's a shaken bourbon cocktail with uh, grapefruit and honey. Um, and this is a little different than your classic uh, Manhattan or old fashioned style cocktail. And we'll get into what the differences are in a little bit. And then the last one is, uh, I love chamomile. Uh, and we do a lot of chamomile toddy style beverages, but this one's called a spring buzz and it's served over ice. And I think uh, it captures the flavor of spring and summer for that matter really well. But our Arizona winter is, uh, pretty spring-like for where I grew up in the northern Midwestern United States. So without further ado, um, let's get along to some bourbon history. Um, bourbon is a spirit that is, uh, that's unique to the U.S. Um, there have been some copycats, uh, but in the U.S., in order for in the US, the European Union and Canada for that matter, in order for a bourbon, for a whiskey to be labeled bourbon, it has to have been made in the United States and it has to have, sorry about that, a little technical difficulty there. Um, and it has to have at least 51% corn in the mash. And the mash is basically um, the heated grain mixture that's fermented in order to create any sort of spiritus beverage. Um, it's fermented and then uh, strained and distilled. And the end result is the liquor. Uh, in this case, it's bourbon. So 51% uh, um, in order to be labeled straight bourbon, it has to be aged for at least four years. Um, and if it's just labeled bourbon, it has to be uh, aged at least two years. So um, blended bourbons can have uh, other things in them, flavorings. Uh, they can have um, uh, non-aged um, grain alcohol in them. They can have any number of things. So a blended bourbon, with notable exceptions, 
um, is generally considered inferior to a straight bourbon. And um, a straight bourbon, a couple examples of straight bourbon we have with us are Woodford Reserve. Um, we have Maker's Mark. Um, and we have Beam and Evan Williams. Beam and Evan Williams are, um, let's say, more value conscious selections, but they are very tasty. Uh, most bourbons, all of these included, are uh, aged after the fermentation and the distillation process are completed in charred oak barrels. Most, most American whiskeys are aged in American oak barrels. There is some French limousine oak as well as some Czech oak um, and other types of European oak, but most of the whiskey produced in the United States is in um, US oak staved barrels. And what they do is there's a, a place called a cooperage in most whiskey distilleries. And that's where they take the oak staves, which are the slats that make up the barrels. And they put a couple of hoops around them and they go over a fire uh, that's oak wood. And it's basically at the charcoal stage when they put it over the, uh, put the, the hooped staves over the fire. So it actually chars the inside of what will become the barrel. They allow it to cool and then they put the rest of the hoops around it, form it into the barrel, put the, um, the cap and the bottom on and it, it's filled with whiskey and the whiskey actually uses the, the charring, the scarring, if you will, of the oak to gain access to the, the flavor compounds in the wood that flavors and, and colors uh, bourbon whiskey. So you see this amber color when whiskey goes through the distillation process after it's mashed and then um, it's distilled. And, and a pot still basically is uh, just a, a giant vat that has coils coming from it. And as the water uh, is, is kind of boiled out of the, the, uh, the mash, the alcohol concentrates and becomes higher. When that distillate is uh, condensed into a jug or uh, however they do it, it, you know, if they're old school, small producers, uh, it goes into smaller pots. Um, the large producers have a, a tremendously mechanized and uh, hygienic process by which they uh, create their white dog, if you will. White dog is the, the primary distillate of the whiskey. When it comes out of the still, it's completely clear. It looks like vodka. Um, and it's uh, uh, interesting. It's what we think of as moonshine, really. Um, it, so all of the color in modern day bourbon comes from the wood casking. When it's distilled, it looks exactly like vodka or gin or any other clear spirit. Um, so once it goes into the barrels, it can be aged for as little as three months or for decades. Um, and once it's bottled, uh, the age on the bottle has to represent the youngest component of the whiskey. Very few whiskeys that we buy are single batch whiskeys. Um, not many of them are made all at one time and then the result is exactly 15 years old when it goes into the bottle. Usually there are younger, what they call juvenile and older whiskeys that comprise to make up a standardized whiskey like Woodford or like Makers. So every time you open a bottle of Makers or Woodford, it's going to taste almost exactly like the last bottle of Makers or Woodford that you opened, which would be next to impossible if they were trying to do it all in one shot. So does the darkness of the bourbon mean anything? Is it aged longer? Is a darker bourbon better than a lighter bourbon? That's a great question because the, um, because the obvious uh, answer would seem to be, sure, if it's darker, it's got to be older and better but it can actually mean several things. Some bourbons, especially um, more price sensitive or value conscious bourbons will add caramel coloring 
to make them appear darker so that the perception will be, hey, that's dark. It's got to be a great bottle of bourbon. Not that it isn't necessarily, all of its color may not necessarily come from the aging process. Um, there's another component, the level of char on the barrel is going to dictate some of the darkness uh, of the resulting liquid. So uh, yes and no would be the answer to that question. Um, you look at uh, Woodford and you look at Makers and I don't know if you can see this, but Woodford actually, uh, for all intents and purposes, looks quite a bit darker than the Makers. But if you taste them side by side, yes, you're gonna be able to tell a, a, a real difference between the two whiskeys, but the relative quality is not necessarily going to be uh, dictated by the darkness of the whiskey. So uh, I know that's kind of a, a sort of answer, but it's it's as good as it gets in this case. Um, the, the answer is sometimes. So, all right. Good question. Keep them coming. Uh, so, all right. We went through bourbon, a little bit of history. So the name bourbon. Um, I think we're all familiar with the Bourbon dynasty, um, all of the Louis in France and so forth. Um, they were the ruling dynasty in France for a very long time, most notably when um, the U.S. colonies were formed. And there are a lot of things in the American South uh, named for them. Uh, Bourbon Street in Louisiana, Bourbon County in Kentucky. The original Bourbon County was part of Virginia. When the 13 colonies were first formed, they had a much larger footprint than they do now. And when they achieved, when they became states, they became smaller in some cases. And in the case of Virginia, Bourbon County, Virginia encompassed what's now uh, Bourbon County, Kentucky, as well as 13 other uh, counties in, in Kentucky. So, um, when, when we try to figure out why uh, bourbon is called bourbon whiskey, the, the, the short answer is it's named for uh, the bourbon dynasty. The longer answer is it depends on who you ask because the people from Bourbon County, Kentucky are 100% sure that uh, it, it's named for Bourbon County, Kentucky, which is where they feel the best bourbon in the world is made. Um, if you talk to uh, the guys at Brown Foreman or some of the big uh, producers of bourbon, they may hearken back to another answer, which is dictated by um, the fact that New Orleans was a huge port for doing business with Europe um, in the uh, 18th century. And a lot of French traders um, would bring cognac over leave it and purchase bourbon and take it back because bourbon um, was much more cost effective for French people to drink than cognac was because of the premium price charged for cognac as well as the fact that cognac is distilled from grapes. Basically you make wine and then it's distilled to make a liquor and it's much more expensive to produce than something that's produced with corn or rye or wheat. Uh, so there was a cost differential there. So anyway, there are a couple other um, theories as to why it's called bourbon, but it all harkens back to the bourbon dynasty. Um, so we go there. Uh, legal requirements, we discussed those a little bit. Um, the big thing is if it's labeled bourbon whiskey, 51% or more of the mash has to be corn. Um, it has to be at least 80 proof which is 40% alcohol by volume. It can't be more than 160, but I've never seen 160 proof bourbon. That'd be 80% alcohol. Um, it would be like basically putting Everclear into uh, a cask and just selling whatever came out of the cask. And you'd have people going blind and it would not be a good thing. So um, there are lots of Cast strength bourbons, I've never seen one of those higher than about 107 or 108. And those are uh, very heady. So you, I, you see those, but they're, they're the bigger higher end bourbons. Um, some of the small batches will have, have a higher cast strength like that. Same with scotches. There are a lot of cast strength scotches, but most are, are lower 
potency. Um, all right. How do they arrive at the proof rating if it isn't the same percentage as the amount of alcohol? Proof rating is basically, uh, so 40% alcohol by volume is 80 proof. So if you take the percentage of alcohol that there is in liquid, it, the, the alcohol by volume would be your exact percentage of the liquid that is alcohol content. Cut that in, double that, and that's your proof figure. Um, it's just, it, the reason the beverage industry did that was to make a more dynamic scale for uh, describing and rating the, the level of uh, strength in a particular potable. Um, I hope that answers your question. If not, uh, give us follow-up. But that's the reason that it's not, it doesn't just say 40, it does say 40% alcohol by volume on the label, but it says an under 80 proof and it's in real small print. Um, and it's basically, it's because that's the way the, the beverage industry um, decided to do things. All right. Um, so uh, the uh, U.S. Senate passed a resolution officially declaring two, uh, September 2007 to be the National Bourbon Heritage Month. So um, bourbon was declared by Congress to be America's native spirit. So I don't know that uh, there's... I don't know, however you feel about the Senate and uh, the government in particular, that they've uh, decided that bourbon is America's spirit of choice, I think is telling. And I bet if we did the research, there's a heck of a lot of bourbon sold in the District of Columbia. And I wonder how much of it is paid for by the distillers. Um, all right, Bardstown, Kentucky. If you've ever been to Lexington or the Lexington area, um, there's uh, the Whiskey Heritage Trail there, and it's bourbon producers in about four or five towns, and you can extend it way out, uh, and the bourbon trail covers a big part of uh, south and central uh, western, sorry, eastern Kentucky. Um, just beautiful country, um, and we're, a lot of us are RVers. Um, if you have an RV and you've never pulled through that center section of the country, great place to go, pitch your tent for a couple of weeks and just spend some time. Um, there are uh, carriage tours, there are van tours, there are bike tours, there are basically any kind of tour you uh, would like. There are also self-guided tours and I cannot recommend it highly enough. Um, you can even segue up into Indiana a little bit. There are some great distillers in Ohio as well. Um, just a fun section of the country to traverse. And if you're anything like me, um, uh, traveling uh, at your stops, nothing says the end of the day like a nice Manhattan or old fashioned cocktail. So bourbon country is a good place to be to stock up your liquor cabinet for spending your winters in Arizona. Um, let's see. Lots and lots of fun cocktails to make. Uh, we're like I, I told you the the couple that we're going to do today, but um, my wife Michelle is a huge fan of a Manhattan, and you can play around with a Manhattan recipe. Manhattan is basically um, two parts bourbon, one part vermouth, and we'll get back to the vermouth in a minute, and a couple of shakes of uh, bitters. I've got orange bitters here as well as uh, Agostura aromatic bitters. You, there are all different kinds of bitters out there. You can play around with all different kinds of flavors. But what Michelle likes is either rye whiskey or um, Woodford with, we use three different vermouths. We use uh, Punta Mes, which is a very dark um, kind of Aperol flavored vermouth. We, and we use two Dolan vermouths. Dolan makes a rouge that's wonderful. Uh, it's as good or better than some of the $30, $40 a fifth ones. And it's, I don't know, $13 for a fifth. And Dolan makes a really good dry vermouth. So we like a perfect Manhattan, which is pretty much equal parts sweet and dry vermouth um, with, so it's one part of that. So one third of each of those vermouths. 
um, two parts or two ounces of um, bourbon or rye whiskey, and then a couple shakes each of the bitters and top it all off with a lovely cherry. We use the Luxardos. Um, you can use Morellos, you can use their wonderful cherries from the Dalmatia coast in Croatia. They come in these beautiful little earthenware jars. I'm sure you've seen them in liquor stores. Um, we like a nice uh, orange zest in ours as well because that acid from the orange oil really makes the, the sweet flavor of the cherry and the sort of astringency of the bourbon pop. Uh, so that's just a fun cocktail. Anybody needs a recipe on that, I can certainly provide it. Uh, just let Carrie know through the link and we'll, we'll fire out a recipe on email. Um, all right, so European whiskey versus American whiskey. Um, European whiskeys, i.e. primarily Scotch whiskey and Irish whiskey are, um, I don't wanna say more refined because that's not really what I mean. Um, they, they have a more esoteric flavor palette. Um, Scotch whiskeys can be anything from real sort of iodine-y, um, seaside, briny kind of aromatics and flavors uh, with the Islays. Um, the Highlands can have a real heathery sort of uh, autumnal kind of aromatic. Uh, the Lowlands can be really super peaty and it's almost like you can it's almost like you're licking a rock. I, I know it's weird, but it's like there's so much peat flavor, you can smell um, the moors. Uh, it's just, it's nuts. And they're all over the place and they're less about, um, they're less about imparting tons and tons of flavor from the wood. They're more about um, giving you a sense of place based on the mash that they're made with, and the water that's used because the water that's used is very indicative of the place. One of the things that uh, the, the Bourbon County distillers tout as being um, the reason Bourbon County, Kentucky is the cradle of bourbon whiskey is that there's this tremendous limestone aquifer and all the water leaches through the limestone and you get this tremendously clean mineral water uh, and they say that's the core of why bourbon from Kentucky tastes like whiskey from nowhere else. So um, the Scottish and the Irish would kind of say the same thing. Uh, they tend to be less fiery, less heated as well. Um, you'll find that core Scotch drinkers are not big fans of iced beverages because they want to be able to taste their spirit with just a little bit of water. Um, and bourbon drinkers tend to like a little more ice because bourbons are a little fiery and the ice sort of um, mellows the, the flavor of the bourbon a bit. Um, all right, I think we should move along to some cocktail production unless, uh, does anyone have any questions they wanna fire up? It's fine if you don't, it's, that's all right too. <laughs> Um, all the ones so far. Okay, good deal. All right, so we're going to start with the Winter Bourbon Smash. And I'm going to do all of these in a shaker cup, even though some of them are served over ice. Um, and the reason we're going to do that is because you can fully incorporate the flavors that way. And also, we'll have ice in the glass when we pour the cocktail out of the shaker cup over the ice and the ice in the glass will stay ice longer than if we just made the cocktail in the glass where it would turn into water faster and it would dilute your cocktail much more quickly. So without further ado, we're going to do the bourbon smash and um, you'll start with, I don't know, like a half a cup of ice or so. Remember, we're going to pour it over ice so it doesn't have to um, have all of the, the amount of ice you want to go in the glass. And we'll make this one with makers. So we're going to do um, 
two tablespoons of bourbon. This, this is just a, a key tidbit there for you. Tablespoon is a half an ounce. So two tablespoons would be one ounce um, and eight tablespoons would be a quarter of a cup. And just a little more. All right. Um, and we're going to use, um, instead of triple sec, we're going to use Grand Meunier. And the reason I do this is because Grand Meunier is an orange liqueur that's made with cognac. Um, triple sec simply means triple sweet in uh, French. And it's a, it's, it's a sweet um, brandy. And in the case of triple sec, it's, it's brandy that's never been aged in wood. And in the case of Bulls and Hiram Walker and the lower end triple secs that you find available in the States, it's, it's not even made with, with brandy. It's made with uh, just um, neutral grain spirits. So it's um, fake orange flavored sweet. And, and I'm not really a big fan of that. If you want the clear triple sec, um, go with Cointreau. Cointreau is wonderful. It's made with a non-wood cask uh, brandy and it's lovely. It's a little more expensive, but it's one of the cases in which you get what you pay for. Is it an orange kind of taste? Yes. Triple yeah, triple sec has an orange flavor. Um, in the case of Grand Meunier and Cointreau, Sevilla oranges, are they basically go into the cask with with the the liquor? How much of the Grand Marnier did you put in? Oh, one ounce. I'm sorry, it's, it's on the recipe. So, um, sorry, it's one tablespoon. So basically, a half ounce for one drink. Um, and then we're going to do two to three tablespoons of orange juice. And then we do oh, the preserves. So I have just an organic um, seedless raspberry preserve. If you want to, you can do any kind of fruit with this you want. And if you want to crush your own fruit, like you can use peaches uh, and just take the skin and the pits out and throw them in a food processor and just make a puree. Um, if you want to use... Uh, Gosh, yeah, I wouldn't use bananas, they're too pulpy. Um, if you wanted to use strawberries or raspberries, with raspberries or any kind of seeded berry, you're gonna want to uh, make sure you push it through a chinois or a fine sieve, you know, like the small um, little colander, usually it has a handle on it and it's kind of cone shaped. If you have one of those, oh, okay, yeah. All right. I use those anytime I have seeds or like if there's herbs in a cocktail you're making. A little extra shake there because of the preserves. Um, you're going to want to break those up nicely because nothing ruins a cocktail party like a, uh, like a gloppy cocktail. There we go. And finish it off. I like to take uh, a, a zester, just um, a peeler, just like a carrot peeler. And I get a nice big chunk of orange peel. That way you can twist it and you can actually see, I don't know, you probably can't see it from there, but you can see the orange oil um, squirting out of the pores of the peel. And that gives you that nice kind of bitter acidity 
that complements the sweetness of the cocktail. So there you have it, the winter bourbon smash. All right, on to drink two. This one is the Brown Derby. And the Brown Derby, uh, I don't know if anybody's from uh, LA or, or Southern California, but there used to be a famous restaurant in the jazz era called the Brown Derby. And it was actually shaped like a Brown Derby. Um, and this cocktail was an homage um, to that restaurant. And there are a couple rumors about how it started, but the one that I like the best is that uh, there was um, a place called the Vendome Club in LA. And it was she, she and all the movie stars went there. And a lot of them went there after they had eaten at the nearby Brown Derby. So as kind of a thanks for sending us your after dinner clientele, um, let's see. Um, they crafted it in the 30s. Um, and it, I don't know, it just, I, I love to think about Hollywood in that era because it was all tuxedos and ball gowns and nice dancing and live music and just, you know, a hair different than things are today. Kind of the equivalent of what air travel was like back in the day compared to what it's like now, you know. So it was suits and dresses and now it's, you know, sweatpants and neck billows. So it's just an, an homage to a different era. All right, so we'll get started with that one. And for this one, um, I did some prep work in advance. You'll notice in the recipe that it calls for honey syrup. And honey syrup is basically just simple syrup that's made with honey. And simple syrup, for anyone who's never made it, is what's um, used to, to sweeten a cocktail with sugar. And it's equal parts uh, granulated sugar and boiling water. And you just stir the sugar in until it uh, goes into solution and you don't see any granules anymore. And um, then you allow it to cool and it mixes the sugar into the liquid with no gritty um, particulate. Um, this is the same idea with honey. Honey is kind of hard to mix into a cold liquid. Um, so what we do is we take equal parts uh, honey and um, boiling water. And I just use a little electric kettle and got my water up to 212. And then I put half a cup of honey in a coffee mug and I put half a cup of that hot water in mixed it and then it wasn't quite done yet. And rather than try to put it on the stove, because if, if honey, if it boils actually, it starts to um, crystallize again as it cools. So you don't wanna boil it, you just want it to, to heat up fully. So it goes fully into the solution. I just put it in the microwave for a minute and then stirred it again, allowed it to come to room temperature and put it in my little handy uh, Dazenstein um, creamer. I don't know if anybody uses this cream, but it's awesome. It is, it's really good. It's worth the extra money. And plus you get these little bottles. Um, okay, so uh, we'll start out on this one with the bourbon um, and it's one and a half ounces of bourbon on this one. Let's try this one with the makers or with the uh, Woodford. So my little measuring cup. What did I do this? Oh, there it is. I got Michelle at home to keep track of everything when I'm doing stuff. All right. All right, so one and a half to one ounce of fresh squeezed grapefruit. And we'll do one half ounce of the honey syrup. All right. Then this one, I shake this one kind of hard because uh, you want a sort of frothy 
top and the sugar will help with that, but the harder you shake it, the more froth you're gonna get. Right. Maybe shook it a little too. <laughs> we'll go this way. There we go. Now to garnish this one. Same thing, but a grapefruit. So we'll do a little bit of a grapefruit twist. Nice big twist. And again, pop the oil on top. Give it a little rub around the rim and drop her in. And there you have brown derby. All right, mm. you can smell the citrus oil in here. It smells good. All right, and last but not least, we're gonna do the spring buzz. And the spring buzz, uh, chamomile cocktail. Um, and I love chamomile. And just to plug next month's class, we're gonna do a vodka class and we're gonna do a really cool uh, fizz cocktail. That's uh, Grey Goose, um, Elderflower, and Chamomile, and it's out of sight. It's a beautiful spring drink. So anyway, tune in next month for the vodka class. But the um, spring buzz is chamomile tea, which I've steeped in advance. And I use um, Thrive Market, and we order a lot of stuff from Thrive. It's a mail order company. Um, good organic products, really well priced, and they deliver it right to your door. Uh, fun stuff, check it out. But any kind of chamomile will do. Um, celestial seasonings makes a lovely chamomile. And if this is a pre bedtime cocktail, you could even use sleepy time, which is chamomile and it has valerian root and all kinds of other stuff that'll help you sleep. And bourbon always helps me sleep too. So it's got that going for it. Um, all right. So the tea, and then we're gonna use the honey syrup again because I think it, it mixes in better than uh, just straight honey does. Um, with whiskey, St. Germain, which is an elderflower liqueur. Uh, elderflowers, beautiful mountain flowers, very aromatic, classic uh, cocktail um, addition. Uh, if you don't have it in your bar, check it out. It's a little spendy, but they do make the small bottles and it's nice to have around just as a little something extra. Um, all right. So we've already done the tea. I've already got the lemon syrup. So the recipe that Carrie sent you a link to tells you to mix it in the glass. Again, I'm gonna mix mine in a cocktail shaker because I just like it that way because You've cooled it off and it doesn't dilute once it hits the glass at the same rate it would if you just mixed it all in the glass. Right. So for this one, let's go back to the makers. So we'll do one ounce of whiskey. Oh, and by the way, um, I don't know if everybody has one of these, but it's made by OXO, um, the Good Grips people who make like the large handled uh, kitchen tools, peelers, um, graters, spatula spoons, that kind of stuff. Originally started out as a company for uh, people with problems gripping things. And it's just, it exploded because it's so, they're so easy to use. Anyway, this little measuring cup on the inside, if you can see it, has um, gradiated lines. So it takes you all the way from a quarter of an ounce up to four, uh, two ounces at the very top. Um, and this is a wonderful little tool. It's great for measuring stuff for drinks, but it's also great for measuring things like 
liquids that you need in cooking in smaller amounts. You don't have to get out your you know eighth of a cup, quarter of a cup measure because you can do it all with this. All right, so we got the whiskey in. We're gonna do the elderflower. It was one ounce of whiskey and a quarter ounce of Saint Germain, but I think that's a little stingy. We're gonna do a half ounce of the Saint Germain because it's delicious and because it's here. All right. Um, and then we do uh, two thirds a cup of the tea. And two thirds of a cup is gonna be six ounces. No, that's three quarters. Two thirds of a cup will be four ounces-ish. That's the honey, sir. How much honey do we need? See, I was ahead of myself. Two teaspoons, okay. That's roughly two teaspoons. All right. A little generous squeeze of lemon. And I just have like, I don't know, almost half a lemon here. All right. We'll do this. These glasses are uh, from my house. These are Michelle's grandparents' highball glasses. They used to drink um, highball every evening. My, uh, her grandfather was a pharmacist and he would come home from work. Uh, it was an old time pharmacy. He was the pharmacist, but he was also the soda jerk. They had, it was back when they had a soda counter, ice cream counter in the pharmacy. And uh, he would have a highball uh, and they would talk about his day. And it was uh, very fond memories for them. And when they both passed away, these came to us, especially for Michelle, because, uh, well, because she just loved them and she loved to hang out with them. And later in her life, she uh, loved a highball as well. So, so they, they were her behest from What's them. A well, a highball is really any spirit um, with a mixer. It's traditionally just served in this glass, but like, you know, a gin and tonic, a bourbon, ginger, um, vodka, soda, they'd all cla be classic highballs. All right. So we're going to garnish this one with a little lemon wedge and from the Lifestyle University Garden, we have some little flowers here, stevia flowers. All right. And there you have the spring buds. Well, it was fun stuff. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was somewhat illuminating and worth your time. Uh, somebody wanted to know if you have a preference of shakers or is, are all shakers pretty much the same? You see some glass, you see some. Powder. Yeah, um, well, when you're in a bar, you, you probably see some of these shakers, but you really see a lot more bartenders using a pint glass and a shaker cup together. You can get a really solid shake with those. And I, I have those at home. I also have fancier cocktail shakers that I use when we have company over. Um, I, you know, it, it's all about what feels good in your hand, what you like the looks of, because I, you know, it's a glass with a lid and a cap on it. A lot of it is the set aesthetic value. So whatever you wanna see on your bar, or pull out of your liquor cabinet is probably the right one for you, I'd say. Yeah, no, so if it's a pint glass, um, this one's kind of flared, but you can do it. A pint glass, yeah, a pint glass is used like this. So you load it up with ice and your beverage.
And then you take the pint glass and put it over the top and shake it like this. And then when you're ready to pour, I've been a long time since I've done this, but you can pour like this. Well, you notice my, my problem right there. So anyway, that's how you would do the pint glass setup. Um, and it's just, like I said, it's personal preference. Um, the guys behind the bars are using those because you get the most bang for your buck as far as shaking. And also all they have to do is dunk them in water, um, dunk them in their sanitizer solution, dunk them in water, and they're ready for the next drink. Whereas these, you got to clean, you got to get brushes and stuff. Is there any particular type of bitters that you prefer to use? Um, well, Agostura um, has been around the longest. And they're these. They're the ones, you see these in almost every grocery store. Um, this is their aromatic bitter. And this is the orange flavored bitter. This one tastes uh, a little more like orange. It tastes like orange peel, like bitter orange peel. This one has a real herbaceous nature. This is the one that I first started using. And this is the classic one for cocktails like uh, an old fashioned or a uh, uh, Manhattan. Um, but there are literally hundreds of bitters makers uh, out there now. And it's part of the craft cocktail culture. Um, there are watermelon bitters. I had a really good cocktail made with rhubarb bitters the other day. Um, there are just, uh, they're root beer bitters. I mean, just more and more every time I look. And there are lots of fun cocktails that you can make with all of them. But if you're looking for just a good standard bitters, I get one each of these and play around with them and see which one you like the best. Is there a reason that you strain off your ice instead of using your ice from your shaker? The ice in the shaker is going to be misshapen. Um, it's in the shaking process. It's all broken up. Uh, and rather than serve that in a restaurant or it's just because of my background. I grew up in the restaurant business and you wouldn't want sloppy ice going in the glass that you're sending out to a customer that they're paying for. You want it to appear as pristine as possible when it goes out. And that's why I always pour them over, over fresh ice. All right. Well, it's been a lot of fun for me. I hope you all found it somewhat informative and uh, a fun way to spend an hour or so. And um, we're, uh, we're, oh, one more. Looks like we got one more. Have you seen the large ice balls? That yes. You use? And do you have a preference on using those or not? They're great. Um, if you really want something that you don't want diluted, like a really nice whiskey, but you don't like whiskey warm. If you like whiskey to be cold, you can either use the, the ice balls and I think they look killer. Um, the problem with them sometimes is finding a big enough glass so you can get enough uh, liquid in there to make an actual drink. Um, they also make whiskey stones. Um, they're little pieces of granite uh, that are squares or sometimes they're, you can get them in your initials and all kinds of different stuff. You just keep those in the freezer. And then when you pull them out, they'll cool off your whiskey or your scotch or whatever you're drinking. I know whiskey is, scotch is a whiskey, but when I think whiskey, I think of this. Um, so you, it, it won't dilute at all, but it will cool off your beverage. So yes, I, I like formed ice of all kinds. The, we have a couple of big square cubes as well at my house and they're fun. I don't know. It's just a lot of work at the end of the day to get them out and polish them off and get them out of the mold. They're there for company. When it, when it's just me, um, I use the ice out of the so, freezer. When I have a party and I'm doing like old fashioned, uh -huh. I, I do a bunch up ahead of time and I put them in a big Ziploc bag and that way they're ready to go. So I don't Okay. Have, oh, that's I cool. Like four molds. I actually might make 12 of them. That's, that's a fantastic I idea. Uh, Carrie just said, she has them and she'll make them up ahead of time. If she's having people over and she knows she's going to serve fancy cocktails, she'll make the ice balls up, store them in a Ziploc bag in the freezer, and she'll have a dozen or 18. I don't know what kind of parties she throws, probably 24 or 30, you know. So that's a great idea, too. Um, you can also go the other direction. Uh, there's shaved ice that some people like. And you can get a shaved ice sort of 
shaver, it's not really like Aloha snow cone ice. Um, it shaves, it's more like cheese grated ice. Uh, you can actually buy a little countertop machine. One of my mom's best friends love drinking these things called mists. And a mist is basically a glass packed full of like, they call it crunchy ices some places. You get it in some like convenience stores, fast food restaurants. But she pack a glass full of that and just pour booze over it. So it was a vodka mist or, you know, a bourbon mist. And it was like, wow, that's, it sounds classy. Yeah, a bourbon slushie. Ooh, which are also delicious.